This is the second video on linear models superposition and this particular video in fact is going to focus on what you do when you have a nonlinear model. So linearization is the process by which we approximate a nonlinear system with a linearized system. And when we do this we can then use superposition again. Okay? So if you remember from the first video, um, with superposition we can calculate the response or the total response of a system by adding up the responses of uh, the individual responses due to different scenarios and that can be very valuable. So we're looking at how we can apply this to nonlinear systems and the first step is to linearize. Okay? Linearized models have been shown to be adequate for carrying out a lot of control systems analysis and design um, and therefore it does make sense to linearize systems where that is valid because it makes life much easier and it works. So let's have a look at some systems which maybe have some nonlinear behaviors which you will have to encounter and deal with. What about flow through restri restriction? Um, we tend to, um, in, in this module, use the approximation that the flow is proportional to the depth, but in reality, a much more accurate um, representation is this one here, where the flow actually is proportional to the square root of the depth. What about heat loss? Heat loss is commonly taken to be depend on the fourth power of the temperature. Or rate of reaction could be, in fact, any nonlinear equation. So I've put an arbitrary one down here. I would encourage you to have a look and find some other examples of nonlinearity. You will find lots. Um, the key thing is to recognize nonlinear behaviors exist. And um, what we want to do next is ask, how do we deal with them? So simple control and behavior analysis tools rely on linear models um, and commonly we use Laplace transforms. And then, hence it's desirable to model a process with a linear model where this is good enough or fit for purpose. And in many cases, this will be true. So where a system does not move far from a specified steady state, then it's possible that a linear approximation will capture the key dynamics well enough. And in those cases, we will use a local linear model. And that's what we're going to do here. So first, an example. Here's a curve. It looks a bit nasty. It's got a sine term and an exponential term. And you'll say, yeah, OK, that's clearly nonlinear. Now, let's focus on a particular domain, um, x between 0 and 10. And let's sketch that curve. And there it is. It's the red curve. But what is fairly clear, I hope, is that if you stay in the region of here, we've um, said, let's look at x equals 2. If you stay in that region, then clearly the curve is pretty close to a straight line. So there we've marked that. And therefore, if you stay in that region, a linear approximation will be good enough. And so here's a case where you've got a nonlinear system, but you know that a linear approximation will be good enough. So how do we go about doing linearization? Well, those of you who are good at maths will immediately think of Taylor series. And in fact, that's what we're going to do. We're going to use a Taylor series. What do we do with the Taylor series? Well, in essence, a Taylor series matches the derivatives and the value of original function at a specified point. OK. It uses deviation variables, that is the distance from the specified point. So if you look at this equation here, we will make that um, slightly clearer. So first of all, we look at the deviation of the outputs. There you go, f minus fxs. So if the specified point is xs, then fx minus fxs is how far the output is moved from your specified point. Similarly, x minus xs is how much the x has moved from the specified point. And if you look in this white box, you'll see all we've done is written down a Taylor series expansion. We've given the first um, few terms explicitly, but clearly all the terms are written in terms uh, as deviations from the specified point. Now, what we're going to do is represent the uh, Taylor series in a slightly different format just to make life a little bit easier, perhaps a bit more intuitive. 
Okay. What we're going to say is if you do a first order Taylor series, and that's what we've got here, a first order Taylor series, in fact, is just like putting a straight line through this nonlinear function where you match the value and the gradient at the specified point. Because you'll see here's the value at the specified point, and here's the gradient at the specified point. So all you're doing is matching the value and the gradient at the specified point. Or if you want to look at deviation variables, delta x and delta y, we've got a, um, you will find that it reduces to a straight line that goes through the origin. So all I've done here is I've written delta y equals y minus ys, which is that term there, and delta x equals x minus xs, which is that term there. <laughs> and so you'll see the equation has reduced to delta y equals f dash of xs times delta x. So if we write our Taylor series in terms of deviation variables, we get a straight line that goes through the origin. Now, just a note in case it gets forgotten, the specified point xs ys needs to be a steady state when you're applying this technique in systems modeling. So that's an easy mistake to make. First of all, make sure that you're in steady state and you can only use the approximations about a steady state. All right, so here's an example. There's a nonlinear curve, happens to be sine x, and what I'm going to do is show you how I find a first order Taylor series of this curve. First of all, choose a point. There we are. You can see it with a cross. Next, draw a straight line through that point with the same gradient as the curve. There, you can see it. And in fact, that straight line is your Taylor series. Here I've written down how you might do it. So you can see y minus sine of 2.5 equals cos of 2.5, that's the gradient, times x minus 2.5. And this term, of course, is delta y. And this term at the end is delta x. Hopefully now you've got this picture in your head, you'll say, actually doing a first order Taylor series is straightforward. I've been doing that since I was 13 or 14 years old. So now let's apply it to a systems modelling case. So we're going to consider a system which has got this nonlinear flow term. The flow equals beta times the square root of depth. And what we're going to do is consider a linearization about a point where the depth is 1.2. All right. So first of all, let's look um, at how we linearize this term. So at the chosen point, f equals beta root h, which is going to be clearly beta times 1.2. So that's going to be the nominal flow um, at the point we're doing the linearization. Next, find the derivative. Well, if I differentiate this term, df dh, I get a half times beta over root h, and again, I substitute in my specified point, which is h equals 1.2, and therefore I get the gradient at that point is a half times beta over root 1.2. And finally, I substitute it in. So I've got delta f equals f dash times h of s times delta h. Or if you put in the values, I've done that down at the bottom here, delta f equals a half times beta over the root 1.2 times delta h. And the definitions for delta h, delta h equals h minus 1.2, and delta f is f minus beta root 1.2. Hopefully you'll look at that and you say, yeah, OK, straightforward, but that's still not really systems modeling. Um, So let's look at this example here. We've got a model 2 dx dt plus 3 times x cubed minus x equals u. And we want to find a linearized approximation near x equals 2. So what's the first step? First step is to find a steady state okay, at x equals 2. So here we go. I'm going to substitute in um, dx dt equals 0, because that gives me a steady state. Um, x equals 2, and that gives me u equals 18. So my steady state is given by xs equals 2, us equals 18. Next, I'm going to look at the nonlinear term. Here it is, and it's the nonlinear term that I want to approximate 
by a first order Taylor series. Okay, so I'm going to approximate 3 times x cubed minus x by a first order Taylor series. So first of all, I differentiate. So here we go, d dx of 3x cubed minus 3x, and then it gives me that, 9x squared minus 3. And then I substitute in my excess value, and I get 33. So what we've got is the change in the 3x cubed minus x value relative to the steady state point is given by 33 delta x. So now I can write my model in terms of deviation variables. So I've got deviation variable delta x equals x minus 2, another one delta u equals u minus 18. And if I substitute these into my original equation, written in terms of delta x, I get 2 times d dt of delta x plus 33 delta x equals delta u. Okay, so I've now removed my nonlinear term and I've got an ODE, here it is, which you can see has got simple constant coefficients and therefore I can understand the behaviour, but this is only valid where delta x and delta u have small values. Right, here's another example. I've got seven dw dt plus w e to the w over 10 equals 0.2 u squared plus 3 u. Now in this case, you can see I've got a nonlinear term on the left and a nonlinear term on the right. But we don't need to panic. All we're going to do is replace all the nonlinear terms by their first order Taylor series about the chosen point. I've taken a chosen point, u equals us equals 5. So first of all, let's look at um, what happens when we linearize this system. Okay, so I'm going to assume that dw dt equals 0 and u equals 5. And I'm now going to solve the equation. So you can see all I've done is I've said w e to the w over 10 equals 0.25 squared plus 3 times 5. So I've just substituted in the chosen value of u which gives me w e to the w over 10 equals 20. Now, I'm not going to show you how I've solved that, but that comes out with a solution w equals 8.526. So now, I can define my deviation variables. Here they are, as delta w, or here I've used w prime, equals w minus ws, and u prime equals u minus us. So step one, determine the steady state, for which we need the steady u and the steady w, and therefore, we define the deviation variables. Right now, we want to take the Taylor series of each nonlinear term in turn. So first on the left, I want to do d dw of w e to the w over 10. So there we go. We get 1 plus w over 10 e to the w over 10. And then second, I do the d du of 0.2 u squared plus 3u. And there we go. I get 0.4u plus 3. Now, I can substitute in the given values that I've got. So I know what us is, I know what ws is. So what I can find is that the, um, the key term that I'm going to end up with in my differential equation is this term here. Okay? What I'm doing is the change in the value of w e to the w over 10 is given by the thing I've just circled in red. Or, if you like, the whole term included this w s e to the w s over 10, but I'm subtracting that out because I'm doing deviation terms. So what I find is that the first order Taylor series of this nonlinear term is 20 plus 4.3458 w prime. So I've simply substituted in the ws that I got on the previous slide, and I've got this term here, ws e to the ws over 10 is 20, and then the next term on the right is 4.3458 w prime. So I've done the first order Taylor series of w e to the w over 10 at my specified w value. Now similarly, 0.2 u squared plus 3 u comes out to be 0.2 us squared plus 3 us, so that's the steady steady point I'm doing my approximation around. And then I get the deviation, u minus us, times that derivative term, 0.4 us plus 3. And so my Taylor series here is 20 
plus 5u prime. Now what you will notice, hopefully, if you've done this right, that 20 and that 20 are the same because they're going to cancel on each side of the equation. OK, so next I substitute these first order Taylor series in to my original differential equation. So you'll see where those circles came. What I'm doing is I'm basically doing that substitution. So where I had w e to the w over 10, I'm going to enter my first order Taylor series. OK, so that's the 20 plus 4.3458 w prime. Similarly, where I had 0.2u squared plus 3u, I'm going to substitute the first order Taylor series I got for that, which is 20 plus 5u prime. So I do that, and there we go, 7 dw prime dt plus 20 plus 4.3458w prime equals 20 plus 5u prime, and clearly those two 20s are going to cancel. And what I get left with, I'll just have to move that box, a bit of an irritating box, is 7 dw prime dt plus 4.3458w prime equals 5u prime. So again, you see a simple first order linear model. Right, so remind us, the linearized model is only valid locally, in essence for the domain where the Taylor series is accurate enough. Now what do we mean by accurate enough? I'm not going to answer that, but I think you'll find in many cases errors up to about 10% are considered reasonable because there's always uncertainty with real problems anyway. But do be careful because a poor estimate of gain, especially in control engineering, can lead to poor tuning and a poor control design. So if you have done a design around a linearized point so that you've got a control law, remember that control law may only be effective if you stay near that linearized 